Doch, die möchten das mit dem Tisch gerne so. Ich finde die Gesprächssituation auch ein bisschen, weil ich muss mich mal so. Ich werde auch ein Ich werde es ein bisschen flexibel bleiben. Also, oder ich kann auch ich kann ein bisschen zu sitzen. Ja. ja. Ja, aber ich glaube, das ist ja nicht. Weil wir heute bei dem Workshop schon da waren, also für die Workshops, also für den Tag. Das heißt, wir haben gerade gar kein neues Haus. Das wollte ich doch erst dran Thank you. 
Der Einlass vorbei. Wir wissen Bescheid. Mhm. Wir starten. Cool. Hi. Let's begin. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Kasha. I am speaking in the name of School of Resistance, a format that we have been developing and conducting for one and a half years. And uh, we are extremely happy to um, pass over the word to Rebecca Link tonight. I am just starting and opening the evening for today. And as I think you will also introduce our guests for tonight. So I think for everyone, I thank everyone for being here tonight and I hand the word over to Rebecca Link. Let us begin. Welcome from my side as well. Uh, at the beginning, a few pragmatic announcements. Please make sure that your phone is in flight mode. And if people enter the theater a little later, don't be irritated. Not everyone has arrived on time due to traffic. I am moving back a little bit so that we aren't this close together at this table and that we can have a natural conversation with each other. I will start by introducing myself. My name is Rebecca Link. I work for the WDR. I am a radio host and a freelance journalist. And Milo Rau has asked me to uh, moderate this evening for you, and I'm glad to do so. Let me introduce my guests. On the one hand, I am introducing to you the guests that are joining us online, such as Dorin Johan, who is here for the organization Sea Watch tonight. Hello, I'm happy to be here tonight. She is working as a press spokesperson for Sea Watch. And our other online guest is Maximilian Fichel. Hello. 
Hello, good evening. He is a political scientist and an expert for migration. He is researching the migration politics of the European Union. Then I welcome to my left Corina Oikasevic. I'm glad that you are here. She is from Equal Rights Beyond Borders. And she is advocating legal escape routes for refugees. And on my other side, Tarek Alaus. Good evening. Nice to have you. He is an expert for asylum and migration politics. Maybe you know that as a first Syrian refugee, he ran for office for the parliament, but has been threatened so massively that he had to withdraw his candidacy to that office. Why are we here today? We are here in the frame of the School of Resistance. The title of our panel tonight is Human Rights Are Non-Negotiable. This is the name of a campaign launched by the Sea Rescue Organization Sea Watch together with many other collaborators, such as the School of Resistance that takes place in Cologne today, with their Cologne Declaration for a Politics of Humanness and Justice. They are inscribing themselves in that campaign. This declaration has been initiated by Leave No One Behind, the International Institute for Political Murder and Milo Rao, as well as the human rights organizations Sea Watch, the Seebrücke, the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, and the School of Political Hope. And our panel tonight is also entitled, as is the campaign. And I want to first explain the balancing act that I want to try with you tonight. We don't want to get bored, and also we don't want to get depressed, even though the themes that we will be discussing um, can entail a depressing um, atmosphere. But I want to talk tonight about how difficult it is to do justice to this campaigning slogan, human rights are non-negotiable in our daily activist work. Of course, we will not be solving any problems in the 19 minutes that come, but we will try and ask a few interesting questions. I would like to start with you, Doreen, with the motto of our event tonight, human rights are non-negotiable. The question that one has to um, follow up this motto nowadays is always, are they really? Maybe you can tell us something about the campaign Human Rights Are Non-Negotiable before we try and answer this question. You just mentioned that Sea Watch and other organizations launched this campaign because uh, in the last month before parliamentary elections and during the um, electoral campaign, we have noticed that human rights are clearly entirely negotiable for the Federal Republic of Germany, and we wanted to make clear before this election who is to be held accountable for these infractions of human rights. How is Germany contributing to the isolation of the European Union, and what would the new government would have to do so that human rights are taken seriously? At this moment, I would like to give the word to Maximilian Pichel. You are constantly confronted with the reality of European migratory politics. Do you have the impression that European politics um, can even do justice to this idea of human rights being non-negotiable? No, I think that what we are seeing is that the European migration politics has been for 30 years based on one principle only that theoretically, on paper, you advocate human rights, you present them in your speeches, in political agreements, in the Geneva Convention, but when um, people actually want to claim these human rights, the um, minis ministries of the interior in the whole of Europe, in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, keep developing new measures to prevent people from accessing these human rights. Um, this consists in daily pushbacks um, 
on the Mediterranean. These are bilateral agreements such as uh, that between Europe and transit states such as Turkey and Morocco or the cooperation with the Libyan Coastal Guard. And I think we can clearly see that the European migration politic is clearly strategically focused on outsourcing responsibility in order to not be held accountable for these human rights violations. And this is exactly the difficulty that we face when we are trying to criticize this procedure from a scientific point of view or to address them politically. Tarek, you are the only person in this panel who has actually been confronted with that politics, who has experienced those politics. Did you have the impression that on your way to Europe you experienced human rights violations? I hope that you can hear me fine. I haven't only been affected because I myself am a refugee that came to Germany, but also because um, in my daily work I assist um, migrants, refugees in Germany in asylum residencies, and I see that human rights should be non-negotiable, but they, they are being violated um, at the external borders of the EU, but also in Germany itself. And this is a pattern that um, also is based on the ignorance of their own rights by those who are affected by them. And this is why nobody is interested by it. And even if they have been informed by people who are doing this in their daily work, they are prevented from claiming their own rights. Um, there are several difficult steps um, it costs uh, several thousands of euros um, to engage a procedure up to the European level, and these people are, do not own these resources. A clear example is that on the European level, the um, European acceptance um, agreement has not been implemented in Germany up, till, up until today because the implementation of that law, of that guideline, would be much more expensive than the penalty that Germany is paying for not implementing it. And this is why we see that human rights are being exactly measured according to the costs that they generate. The second pattern that I see is that there is structural racism. Human rights are negotiable for refugees, for displaced people. They are not negotiable for white people for the most part. Um, that aren't any people. If a person that has been, if a white person is needs to be rescued at sea, they will be rescued. Displaced people that have drowned by 20 thousands in the past years in the Mediterranean, and we don't even know the real numbers, these are not rescued. And that is a racism that is um, anchored in our society, that is structurally anchored in Europe as a whole. These are the big guns that we are pulling out right now, and I would like to stay with this. You are both jurists, lawyers, and you are confronted with this aspect every day in your daily work. I would I'd like to ask you, Corinna, from your experiences in Greece, for instance, and your work uh, working on the family reunification of refugees, do you share this experience? And what do you think are the reasons for the fact that human rights are in fact negotiable? I think regarding Greece and the uh, external borders of the EU and Greece and Italy, I uh, would like to agree with what uh, my other conversation partner said. Red lines are being crossed daily. Nobody um, is ashamed of it. It is documented and we can see the facts. And I have the feeling that there is an increasing perversion of that situation, that you actually know that you will not be indicted for that kind of behavior. And there are for instance, also judgments. Many don't know that who are not involved in juridical procedures, but um, judgments show 
that um, you can actually take into account that um, take into account the penalty for human rights infractions and you know that the international um, European court uh, is also hesitant to rule in fa to rule against the EU in order to not damage its acceptance by the other member states because it also is relying on the fact that the member states actually follow and abide by the Geneva Convention. We have seen since 2015 that um, there's also movement in this matter, that one is intending to isolate Europe more and more. Our goal tonight is to uh, keep our conversation very practical, to um, actually take our starting point from the everyday practical work of the people who are talking here. And I've heard a word that I've never heard before, which is um, migration service. It's a, it's a word that you can find very strange, very odd. But uh, Corinna, you referred to the International Organization for Migrants that is part of the United Nations. And um, these organizations are um, involved in the outsourcing of the responsibility for migrants to other organizations, for instance, to the European Organization for Frontal and Coastal Control, Frontex, to other countries, such as Turkey. Is that happening out of laziness, or is that an organizational necessity? I address this question to all of you. Please react if you would like to respond. I would like to begin and respond to what you said to Corinna. Even if European courts were ruling clearly, the member states do not hesitate to transgress these rulings and not to abide by these rulings. We have seen this frequently. For instance, um, through mass deportations to Afghanistan, even though um, the situation was um, deteriorating there. Politicians in Aust Austria wanted to make a um, mass deportation to Afghanistan, and human rights organizations have engaged a procedure with the European Court for Human Rights, who then stopped that deportation due to that ruling. And despite this ruling, um, Horst Seehofer has not hesitated to keep deporting people from Germany. And human rights invest so much um, energy and work and time in things that could be applied more usefully to other matters. And in the end, this deportation, despite the terrible images that we saw in the media from Afghanistan, were continued. And this is how we see that this is this procedure is intentional. This is how I come to your to respond to your question. This is not laziness. This is intentional. We need to prevent people from arriving here. They need to be held at a distance. They need to be kept invisible on the social level in the media. And we are trying to outsource all of the work to private organizations, to human rights organizations outside of the external borders of the EU. Even when we say the external borders of the EU, um, we mean the, Gre the Greek islands, but Greece is Europe and it's not an external border of Europe. And what is happening is happening within Europe. And this intention to push this outside of the EU so that it doesn't arrive here and to um, to um, reduce the pull factor, the so-called pull factor, this is a bullshit strategy. There is no pull factor. It has been scientifically proven. When I was in Turkey, at the coast of Turkey in 2014, I was not interested at all who rescued and who didn't rescue. What interested me was that there were a few percent of hope that I might arrive, but in Turkey I would have been 100% dead. So 
the factor is a push factor and not a pull factor, but nobody wants to talk about it. And to add up on what Tarek just said, from a jurist legal point of view, it's really a question of responsibility. Who is responsible if everything is outsourced? So you can say, yes, we wanted to do this, but um, yeah, it was not implemented as we wanted to. Yes, we really had good intentions. And others say, OK, they told us to do this and that. Um, we are just doing what we were told. So um, this is kind of a confusion of responsibility. It's not clear anymore who's responsible for what. And you say that there's the um, Liberian uh, Coast Guard. And you can say, yes, we didn't want this. Yes, we had good intentions. We thought that this would all work out. And of course, um, this is also an, an important element. And who can be held responsible for this? But is this a kind of system? I cannot uh, look inside the heads of those people that are making these decisions. but. Of course, you have the impression that's, that it's systematic because it's just a comprehensive approach. It's going on on so many levels. Maximilian, yes, um, I think you have to take um, a look at the bigger picture. So um, uh, neoliberalism, for example, that has been going on for quite some time now. So this state has this high potential of power. They have always been these uh, authorities that were responsible for protecting borders and so on. And for so questions of social um, commitment, the state uh, is not taking on responsibility anymore. We see this in Greece, for example, the islands of Greece, where the state of Greece, which also had a lot of financial trouble, of course, during the financial crisis, doesn't take on responsibility to say, OK, we are going to organize this. No, we are giving this to private organizations, uh, to relief organizations. And of course, then you cannot take legal action against these organizations. This is just this shift of responsibility. And we've seen this in Germany as well. For example, for the construction of social apartments, social housing, um, the state did not take on responsibility anymore. And then there were all these refugees, displaced people, and they didn't know where to put these people anymore, where to house them. And Millions of people from civil society um, were sh um, showed solidarity and just took, took care of this. But the problem is, if you just have to do this every day to just provide base what um, the basic things the refugees need for their basic needs, then you don't have any um, space, any energy um, to criticize politics anymore. And there was this huge wave of solidarity. And at the same time, we've seen that um, asylum claims are being um, dealt with in a more strict and strict, uh, more and more strict way in Germany. And uh, it is really impossible um, to have time to really get in a personal relationship with refugees and displaced people or displaced people. And but then you don't have any energy anymore to criticize what is going on. This is also essential. Okay, so we are right in this discussion on this discrepancy between um, human humanitarian uh, rules that we thought that they were um, agreed and uh, had, had to be respected. And, and um, of course, there is this possibility, I would just like to uh, stress this, that you can ask questions. So, um, but um, I cannot see questions. This is just a technical issue. So um, just to my colleagues. So yes, please uh, take care of this. Uh, yeah, so, so if I am. Um, I will try to integrate them into our discussion. Okay, so now I would uh, like to ask you, Doreen, um, about Sea Watch because um, um, to stick with what Tarek just said, you are the face of the European external borders when you are doing sea rescue. So you are the first ones, the first people, the people see that come. Uh, over the Mediterranean Sea, for example. So what is the face, the image that they see? That's a good question. So 
there are no state representatives. This is also already a clear sign. So that we are there and are taking on uh, tasks that should be taken on by the state. So these displaced people come to Europe and at first they don't see any representatives of the state because they are not taking care of this. And um, we've already discussed this responsibility that there's an outsourcing of responsibility. And a lot of organizations like Sea-Watch, but also other organizations are present there. They take care of these people, do sea rescue, and take them, take those people on their boats and bring them to Europe. And I, to answer your question, what is our base image? Um, it is uh, that these people are not welcome at all. So they just feel it when they arrive. It's the civil society that is taking care of them and the state doesn't want them. This is the clear sign so that the state doesn't want people to arrive safely in Europe. And uh, in addition, uh, your work is often criminalized. So these countries don't want to help you and they uh, uh, make your work even more difficult. This is what we can see every day. So um, this means that you um, have difficulties on both sides, right? But by both sides, yeah, on the one hand, there are these people that you want to help. You want to show a um, friendly face to them of civil society. And on the other hand, um, there are um, politicians, states that tell you, we don't want you to do this. Yes, of course. Of course, we feel this every day during our work that um, they don't want us to do this kind of work. And this is expressed in different ways. Um, a lot of red tape, for example, um, different administrative measures to block our work, to immobilize uh, ships and harbors, but uh, yes, um, but also states that don't have harbors. So yeah, so it's really difficult for us um, to explain why we are immobilized, why are we criminalized. It's really difficult to explain this to people. Um, so just like, yes, every day we feel this, every day we try to fight this, we try to fight um, to being criminalized and to be able to do our work properly. Um, so we are talking about political responsibilities here. This is our big issue. The, challenge we are talking about and let's start um starts right right at the start so um people are talking about improving living conditions and that um people from politicians are also despairing when you take a look at migration policies we see this um like uh, eric marquardt um, the member of the European Parliament or the development minister Müller, they are talking about, um, they are denouncing what's going on and what is going on in politics as well. But uh, often you need to make compromises in policies. So how can you uh, fight this discrepancy? What can you do against this? by realizing that you don't need to find compromises, but you need to uh, respect human rights. So I mean, compromises are not rules. It, it, you don't need to make compromises by law and stick to what your party does. You always need to see what's right or wrong. And a compromise is always going into the wrong direction. And it's what would be right is to implement human rights totally, 100%. And how you do this, this is what we are thinking about in civil society. And this is what we see in civil society. Um, I know this from this work at the Sea Bridge. And we have municipalities that say, yes, we want to take in displaced people. But there are some municipalities that say, yes, we want to. But unfortunately, we are not allowed to do this. There is no legal basis for this. So it's the um, federal states that need to take care of this. They need to start programs for taking in um, refugees. Okay, so uh, 
there are these different initiatives, but it's the federal ministry, uh, Horst Seehofer, foreign minister, German foreign minister, that doesn't want to accept this. So it's an interesting weekend because it, it's on the eve of the uh, federal elections, and that means that at this weekend we are seeing the last days of Chancellor Angela Merkel, who said in 2015 um, a sentence against a lot of objection by Horst Seefer and other politicians, yes, we can do it. And she didn't close our borders. Yes, so maybe um, to comment on this, it's really also the question how you have a discourse how you define this, saying that no one should be sh should uh, die in the Mediterranean Sea anymore because this pe uh, person needs to flee from a country. So it is saying that it's necessary that, you can also say it, it's necessary that more than 50,000 people come, or you can say it's necessary that no people die. So it's really a question of how you talk about this, what how you define this. Yes, and that's this is what I just wanted to say when I said right and wrong. It is r right to say that people shouldn't die and nothing else. But yeah, getting back to your other question, I would define it in a different way. The borders, it wasn't the case that the borders were not closed at all. They were had been closed for a too long time because in 2015 I was in Europe and I knew that it was not a decision of the European member states, that people could come, that the borders were open. There were no other option to stop people, but to shoot them. That was the only possibility to stop them. And um, the European and German policies couldn't do this. So many people that were on their way to Europe on foot and that were in Budapest, for example, with this racist government, most racist government in Europe, and but they couldn't control these people anymore. And I was one of 10,000s of people at that time um, in Budapest, the main station, and the police, the system couldn't stop these people anymore. It was not an option to open borders, they just had to. So this is why I see this opening of borders in 2015 was just um, thanks to the people that said, we want to be safe. Doreen, Max, you wanted. Doreen and Max, who wants to start? Doreen first, okay. Yeah, so the, we are talking about two different things here. So yes, Angela Merkel said this sentence, yes, we can do it. And maybe she opened borders, and there was this conflict with her own party. But yeah, we are really talking about two different things here. So then people are talking about this conservative, people are talking about this saying, okay, no people should die in the Mediterranean Sea. And I think everybody can agree on this, but what is being done, the kind of action that is taking place is a different thing. So that's what you don't see because Germany has no uh, external borders at the Mediterranean Sea. But at the same time, it's a German policy to participate in Frontex, um, to cooperate with other states for these pushbacks and not accepting refugees, what we've already talked about. So it's a kind of active policy, um, even if people talk about it in a different way. It is presented in different ways. Okay, um, Maximilian, um, would you say that um, we are just behaving like other European states that, um, like Hungary, Denmark, or Austria, we are just, uh, and acting as if we are uh, nice, more nice than them. Yes, definitely. Um, but 
so our action is not nice at all and it we are violating human rights and uh, as you just said um We are taking in people, other European countries should do this as well. We need a European solution. This is what you hear. But Germany has the means. There are municipalities that want to take in refugees, um, hundreds of refugees, displaced people. And um, but still, it is being blocked. Maximilian, would you like to add to that? I would like to talk about both aspects about 2015 and the question of compromise. What kind of compromises are we talking about? The first aspect is that 2015 is being dehistoricized. We describe it um, as if it was 2015 and afterwards. But of course, the German government since the 1990s has been constructing the European border regime. This poli these policies had the consequence that when I started being interested in uh, migration politics, went to my first um, demonstrations against deportation, we had historically low numbers of asylum claims and of arrivals of refugees because the German Republic had managed um, together with the Dub by the means of the Dublin Agreement to keep refugees away from its borders and that this eroded in 2015 also had to do with the fact that we were facing an ongoing crisis of migratory politics and refugee policies in Spain and Italy long before we in Germany talked about the question whether we should accept more refugees in 2015. This is being forgotten in this discussion that there had been going on a crisis of migratory politics since the end of the 1990s and the beginning of the 2000s. Regarding compromise, I think I would always also ask what premises are this com is this compromise based on? And one of the premises is always to interpret migration as a danger, as a threat. Migration is attributed to the Ministry of the Interior. This means that the question of migration is submitted to a perspective that sees it as a threat, as a question of inner security. And I also want to talk about the election tomorrow. I think that even if we have a ministry, the Ministry of the Interior led by someone from the Green Party, from a Social Democrat Party, I think the fundamental policy, the core of the policy wouldn't change because this Ministry of the Interior has evolved during an evolution of 70 years. It has um, been constructed as it based on an administration that has that will not change if um, a different person is leading this ministry. We see it. Um, concerning um, the acceptance of people from Afghanistan, where the Ministry of the Interior is being extremely reluctant, is prioritizing the identity checks before the immediate rescue of people. And even if someone that had a much more progressive stance at the head of this ministry, they would have to break many of the fundamental blockades within this ministry. And I think it's impossible during one legislation period. In order to open this compromise, we would need to take migration out of the Ministry of the Interior and attribute it to a, a different competence. Um, I would like to add to what Maximilian said. This is the same for the foreign ministry who are um, dealing with family reunification, for instance. There are huge problems this issue. It has been like this for several legislations. The policy is extremely restrictive regarding family reunification, even though we have a progressive at the head of this administration. I, of course, want to follow up on that. In the current development in Afghanistan, we have seen in a concentrated manner how much criticism the foreign ministry has faced. Maxim, Maximilian Fichel has criticized the actions of the foreign ministry um, 
during the rescue of um, people from Afghanistan, we have seen that a um, civil initiative to create an airlift to get people out of Kabul was faced with um, obstacles that were purely formal, bureaucratic, and hindered to carry this initiative to the end. As someone who is also um, in their daily work looking to political uh, discourse in Germany, I think that um, I've never seen the foreign ministry this criticized as it recently was. Is this maybe a moment where we can expect this situation to induce a change? Is this a question for me or in general? Please. Briefly. I think the problem is, and everybody who is dealing with this issue knows it for a long time, this is not a surprising development. When I was a juridical referee in the Human Rights Organization, already in 2014, we were receiving demands um, from Afghanistan, from people there, um, that announced that there was a necessity to um, give people a possibility to come to Germany. And to be now surprised that and that every is an expression of this policy of outsourcing, of the fact that one likes to delegate responsibility and not be held accountable. This is a common ground of all decisions in European and German migration politics. And um, it might be surprising that the foreign ministry has been so um, badly prepared to face the situation, but the, in, the internal logic of these policies doesn't surprise me at all. I think we need to call into question some of the fundamental premises, namely the one that regards migration as a threat. Okay, let's talk about these premises. You just mentioned, Maximilian, that we need to change our idea of migration as a threat. But let's talk about alternative ideas and perspective. What is an alternative to that view? The alternative is to consider migration as a fact and that this country is living through migration. We need to stop to treat this topic as a problem, as a crisis, to denounce people as a crisis. They are humans and they need to be guaranteed their human rights. We need a paradigm change at all levels in Germany, politically, but also on, on, on all other levels. I like that uh, the foreign ministry has been criticized, but it's not the only ministry that is to be held accountable for the situation. The blockade in the Ministry of the Interior that I experience every day that there are, for instance, um, people being accepted from Afghanistan and that they are being lost on the way somehow to the um, administration that um, legally deals with refugees when they arrive in Germany. And that people have been forced, even though they had um, received an approval for their claim of um, acceptance, to still make an official claim for asylum to go through the whole procedure and at the end end up being refused. And in the end, they only have the option to leave these um, uh, camps in which live um, people that claim asylum, but these people are not asylum seekers. Um, they, are, were ex they were pressured. Either you are homeless from tonight onwards or you claim asylum and uh, we might refuse that asylum in the end when when we finally um, lift the deportation stop to Afghanistan. This is a strategy that politics has adopted and is continuing. It shouldn't surprise us. The reaction shouldn't um, surprise us. There have been um, falsification of reports about the situation from Afghanistan as well. And there are internal contradictions to these reports. There is on, on one side, there is a report. And on the other hand, there is contradictory report about the directives for um, escape to Afghanistan. And the date below um, that document was suddenly 1st of May 2021. So it means that 
documents are being um, somehow botched together so that in the end we are able to say we didn't know about the situation and we are surprised. Maximilian understand that one legislation, one legislative period would never suffice to um, change, modify the structures within existing administrations to try and be constructive tonight. Um, how can we change this? Is this a political responsibility? Can we expect this from party politics to change um, the situation and the structures, uh, if not in one, maybe in several legislative periods? <laughs> Don't shrug, Corinna. I didn't shrug, I just straightened in my chair. Of course, it is the responsibility of um, politics and the civil society needs to pressure politics and you have to go voting, of course. But I also think that there is not so much to be done um, to the legal framework. There is already a legal framework for so many things, but the question is, are you committed to implement these and are you committed to implement them in the interest of these people? This is, of course, an interesting point um, you might have noticed that yesterday was an international um, action day for the climate. In many German cities, people went on the street to demonstrate for a better climate situation. We have seen that the civil society can apply a certain pressure, a pressure that politics didn't react to at once, but in the end, the German constitutional court did uh, rule in favor of the activists without solving the problem entirely, of course. Nonetheless, this shows that activism might be more successful than politics. Then, I'm uh, to be a little more precise, then the politics of existing parties. I like to look at more historical developments to contextualize these questions. When we look at the 1990s, from the perspective of um, pro-migrant initiatives, um, the 1990s were a defeat because, but there were hundreds of thousands of people who were demonstrating in Bonn and Berlin, many who have been growing up with this theme, politicized um, with this theme, and who were the foundation for for the welcoming culture that, um, we, that we saw manifested from 2015 and other supporting initiatives that supported um, pro-migrant organizations. Sea Watch and others were a reaction to the massive drowning in the Mediterranean and now we are experiencing that through Sea Watch, a kind of international civil society has been formed that was extremely necessary because the question of migration is a transnational question and not a national question. These transnational movements spark many things. They might spark consequences that will only manifest themselves in a few years. And if, and now I'm speaking about the concrete sea rescue initiative, but I think that it also changed something politically. Unfortunately, during this election campaign, migration and displacement played no role at all. So the question, how can we make a paradigm changing shift? I don't see any of the political parties that dealt with this theme offensively. We are again silencing the subject, even though we know that the climate change will create new movements of displacement across the world and all these themes belong together inextricably and this is why we need to connect them better to make the paradigm changing shift that we want. Regarding this, I have a practical example. I've talked to Hasmir Kazim today, a journalist, a book author who just wrote a new book, who told me in our conversation, you just need to look at your weather app on your phone um, just look at any city in Iraq. The medium temperature is 50 degrees. It's obvious to everyone that it is impossible to live there forever. And you can see in this very immediate way 
that climate change and displacement are interconnected and that this interconnection is going to become stronger. Maximilian, you just answered one of the questions on the screens. Do politicians, say individual politicians, even present concepts or approaches to solve this problem? You just said no. Well, of course, there are concepts that are being presented, um, but that are following the pre premise of um, the defense against the threat. But when you look at them closely, um, you just see the EU-Turkey agreement, the work of Frontex, but there are no um, different concepts, no more other concepts. Sometimes you find something with the green, but there are very few concepts and initiatives facing these problems. And um, even though we have been confronted with these problems very concretely in 2015. Parliamentary elections are tomorrow. When we look at journals today, we have all been able to uh, get informed about the state of um, surveys. We see a certain trend towards um, towards still trusting the larger parties here in Germany and that they will give their voice or already have given their voice to these large parties. So it is very questionable if there will be a fundamental change of directive in these fundamental themes. So I ask you again, can we expect a political change or will this remain an issue of the civil society in the next four years? I believe, do I have the floor or not? Doreen, okay. I'm not really optimistic about this because what you could really see um, in this run of to the um, election that this topic was ignored 100%. People did not want to talk about this. There's no party that really um, took up this um, topic of displaced people and really presented solutions. This is not present in politics. And if they are not talking about this right now, I don't believe that this is going to change after this election. So this is just a topic that people don't like, that is negative. You cannot um, get any new votes for this. You cannot win the election with this topic. So I don't believe that this is going to change with the new government. And um, so your question was whether it's whether activists have to take care of this. Yes, it's the civil society that has to take care of this, that has to um, um, bring this on the agenda every time and what we are doing. And this is so frustrating because you just have to ask yourself, is this really working out? Does it have any effect? So we have done this for more than 10 years now. And uh, even though it's not our task to save people and that are in distress at sea, and there are more and more people that die, there are more and more people in camps, there's, there's no change, even though there's pressure going on from us from civil society. And yes, Tarek, um, we have a question on screen, this, and I would write, like to present it, because does only the state, uh, does only the state want to ignore this topic, or are we as civil society less ready to take care of this than we believe? So I would like to give this question, hand this question over to you. Is this structural racism? Yes. But I would like to take a step back and say, um, without a strong civil society, we couldn't have a just policy for this topic. So um, without a strong civil society, a strong civil movement in Germany, in other countries of Europe, that are demonstrating this compromise, which shift more and more to the right wing. And 
we are defending human rights with this. And so we are, keep saying we need a social movement, a leftist movement, and that you say that it is leftist who fight for human rights of displaced people. So this is would be a normal situation. We haven't reached this normal situation. And we are asking whether society is ready for this. So these are rights. It is not something you just grant to people that it, because you are doing them a favor. It's their right. It is my right to um, be accepted. And the alternative would be to um, get out of Geneva Refugee Convention. OK, so I would like to um, talk about the structural racism. Because you cannot just find a political solution for this. This is also the task of society, that each individual individual person takes care of this. Uh, yeah, but you have to. You can have a solution that is political and legal. On the, for example, when the second package on asylum laws um, was introduced, saying that there is no family reunion anymore, all uh, German authorities could say we don't accept these claims anymore. Uh, and after two years, I said, OK, ah, now we have to do this again. We have to accept these claims for family reunification. And they were not even able to handle these claims. So you say that, see that it is a political solution, um, uh, that policy has an impact. And we need clear rulings, clear laws on this. And it's no favor you give. It's a right. So yes, um, I would like to add, add something to this. So. Um, I'm a bit of a skepticist because I'm a lawyer and I like legal solutions. I like to have this as a basis. I don't want any programs that somebody has introduced this year maybe and next year there might be some demonstrations of right-wing people and then you say, okay, there's too many uh, displaced people here, so it's better to have legal solutions. Of course, you need to see how um, you distribute, so to speak, displaced people in Europe um, and, and have clear rules, but not any programs that might be extended or not. Maximilian is nodding quite clearly. Um, so there's another question that I would like to um, talk about right now, because um, We want to have a structural solution. Maximilian, you've just said that you need um, special institutions authorities that are uh, tackling migration issues. So what would the, what could be an authority for this? Um, a ministry? No, it doesn't have to be a ministry, but it's really a cross-cutting issue. We have this, we have discussed climate change um, and migration is linked to this and also to health, for example. Um, if you take a look at the pandemic, for example, so it's not an issue assigned to just any ministry uh, when you want to find a political authority for it, um, if you want to find a political authority for it. And um, yeah, what I found really interesting was what you just said, what Corinna just said. Um, we say that we want to take in people and the problem is that often you just have individual um, steps that are seen as a favor. And we, the, uh, the Geneva Refugee Convention was signed 70 years ago, and we need to think about why does it exist? Why are we celebrating its anniversary? Because the Geneva Refugee Convention was a reaction to the international um, to this deportation of Jews um, and that the international community um, failed when this, these atrocities took place. They didn't want to accept these Jews. And this was the idea behind the Geneva Refugee Convention to grant subjective rights to people, individual rights to people. 
and that they are being accepted not just because there's a positive result during elections um, in our population that people are in favor of this, but to have legal a legal foundation for your claims and at an international scale. This was the idea behind this convention, and you need to take this into consideration um, when you think about these displaced people. And each political movement must see this as the minimum and how you fight for this um, in politics, that's a different question. So yes, you said, Maximilian, that people don't know about the historic background of this convention anymore. And if we talk about how we can raise awareness for this, I asked myself the following question. Are you still there? Yes. Um, maybe we can get an um, answer from you because it would be really interesting for me with these actions that you provide with your different activities. You try to raise awareness for this, to put a focus on this. So, But this is something which is really interesting for me that we are discussing with people here that are um, pre yeah, that are talking about this all the time, so preaching to the choir, so to speak. And so uh, we are in a theater, we are here with people that are interested in this topic, that have information about this education, and that think about such questions that are quite critical. But do you think that with your work, with your action, you can raise awareness for this? You can start, launch a discourse on this, on this topic? Uh, yes. Uh, I. Maybe I can come on stage to talk about this. Um, so this is not all we do. So if you think about the School of Resistance and what we organize here during these two days. So we've got these expert panels and there are a lot of new things that came up that I didn't know about. And um, so we try to create solidarity between politicians, now you're really on stage, Milo. Yes. So um, uh, lawyers, for example, activists, artists. And we had um, a demonstration um, and we, during these two days, we had workshops this morning that were quite helpful where we had also representatives of refugees, activists, organizations that take care of displaced people. And um, you can see that there is this systematic approach. We've already discussed this, that there's a system behind it of uh, depriving people of their rights. Um, and what we that it's not maybe linked to red tape issues, but that a lot of people, big companies, for example, um, that uh, n need these people that are deprived of their rights and they don't want the, it to change because they want to employ them and, and offering poor conditions to them. And so what we're going to see in the film that we're going to change, uh, see later on, um, is that you can see how you can hack the system, so to speak. How can we change the system? How can we uh, give these rights back to people, bring these rights back to people, and what are the possibilities of civil society? One solution that Ivan uh, um, tried was to um, um, take a look at people that are being oppressed, for example, agricultural um, staff and so on, how you can bring these groups together and uh, create the possibility up to consumers to uh, to um, help these people. So to create new distribution channels, for example, um, because these groups are being criminalized right now. And uh, I was really surprised about these numbers that Ivan mentioned. So with the new gospel, with this film that we're going to talk about later on, um, there are 700 people that are now regular employees, so to speak, they um, that we could support with this um, artistic project. So um, 
this is really a handy work we do. This is really work that has an effect. There's, of course, the discourse, the legal side. But what is most important is that you can change the everyday life, that you um, decriminalize these people. And, of course, this election that we that's going on tomorrow. Tarek, you wanted to follow up on this. Thank you, Milo. Thank you very much, Milo. That is exactly what we need. We need to get organized. And that doesn't necessitate huge projects, huge movements. Every each of us um, can be a political activist. Um, if you're at home um, looking at this on Zoom, if you're talking to your parents about this and convincing your parents to change their perspective, every one of us can take valuable action in our immediate environment by responsabilizing each other, by talking about the responsibility that we um, are carrying, the historical responsibility as well of how we created the world that we are living in today. This is a task that we have right now and that we can begin tackling right after this event. It doesn't need huge mov movements, complex projects. It's, of course, good that there are huge projects and movements that drive this um, action, but each and every one can do something and we can't remain in this inactivity, in this helplessness and think, oh my God, we are receiving these terrible images and we just accept them and we get used to them. Um, it has become a habit that people are drowning in the Mediterranean every day. Are we actually um, living a time that we want to remember when in the future we ask ourselves, when did we lose our humanness? I think this is the moment that we lose it. I think I know what you mean when you talk about getting used to this personally. I can say that I don't believe that I'm getting used to this. I know that I am pushing it away oftentimes in my daily life because otherwise um, I would be destroyed by it. But I don't think I get used to it. Um, we're getting used to staying in our comfort zone facing these issues. Of course, you're addressing an important point, um, Tarek, because all of you who are discussing this with us today are in your daily life, in your everyday work, dealing with these issues and attempting to solve them. Not everyone can do this. Not everyone can provide legal assistance like Corona um, and Tarek as well. Not everyone can um, address this issue at the scientific level, such as Maximilian. Not everyone um, can do what Sea-Watch is doing and you are doing, Torin, that is actively pulling people out of the waters. But what can each and every one of us still do in our so very different lives? I want to say something about this. Everyone can donate. Yes, but picking up on this, many people think that donating is a cheap solution. Everybody is protesting. Thank you. Good to know. But I think that many people have that feeling, ah, we're only giving money, we're paying to get rid of the problem. I want to go in the same direction as Tarek, I'm always answering this question in the following way. It's extremely important and necessary that every person individually um, acts on their immediate environment, be it on the narrative that exists around migration, um, that it is a threat, that it needs to be detached from a question of inner security, that we begin talking differently uh, about migration, you can um, attract the attention of the people in your immediate environment um, to this topic because it is usually disappearing from public attention more and more. It has, it is not newsworthy anymore. It doesn't find its space in the news when there are 
uh, when people are being refused at the external borders, when at the European or the national levels um, laws are passed that are further restricting migration. This doesn't find um, enough space, enough attention in our news. And you can still attract attention to it in your immediate environment. This is the responsibility of every individual. It's extremely relevant and it's no less valuable than the actual practical work that we are talking about here. This is exactly what we need to happen, that a change of awareness does actually occur. The problem doesn't go away the moment that people in Germany, that people arrive in Germany and have received international protection. This is when life begins. You need to um, create a life where you have arrived. All these people are here. They live with us in Germany. And the people that I represent, they are usually at that stadium. They have passed the asylum procedure. They want to reunify with their families. They are in the middle of their life in Germany. And they benefit enormously from people who are supporting them because these procedures, um, they last years. If you want to reunify with your family from North Africa, for instance, you need to wait five or six years. You need to keep going. You need support. I remember one of the people I represent um, talking about her friend Sabine, who is great, who helps me uh, get groceries, who helps me carry them. And when I can't pick up my children from school, she helps me, she picks them up. And all my friends are jealous of me for having my friend, Sabine, and all of them want one as well. And I was very happy to hear that there are people just in the neighborhood who are awake, who are looking around and asking, how can I support people? Imagine you're arriving to a different continent and you're entirely alone. People keep needing assistance. I can't, can't imagine it. I can say, that uh, without the support of the civil society, I couldn't have arrived in this country. My life is an example of this. I, um, w I didn't go to German classes, but what helped me most was people who talked to me, who spoke with me, and I learned the language through communicating. I was prohibited from learning the language as an asylum seeker, and this was extremely valuable, and I see it in my work every day. I'm also representing people, and without civil society's support, without individuals who have been accompanying people for years, supporting them for years, and who, um, for instance, fill out forms, uh, make democrat uh, bureaucratic steps, without these people, um, we as an organization could never deal with the number of cases. I have more than 100 open cases, and this is why I need the support that I don't have to make every step for um, every person that I'm representing, but that others from the civil society are organizing to help this, even though it should be a task of the administration, of the municipal administration itself. But we are in a situation where municipalities and the state do not fulfill their tasks, and this is why we need the civil society. We have another question. In school, for instance, I think this would be uh, the question of civil education in schools. There are, of course, studies um, about uh, civic education in um, in schools, in higher education. Um, it is decreasing, of course. The number of hours of civil education are decreasing, and this is the responsibility of the Ministry of Education, I would say, right, to promote this kind of these kinds of lessons and education. The final question that I would ask you, we have had a lot of impressions. You both said you couldn't do your work if you weren't supported by people like Sabine, or people who help fill out forms. But as Doreen already mentioned, there must be moments of frustration, but also moments um, of positive experiences where you think, I'm not doing this for nothing. This is not a vain effort. Can you give us an example, Doreen? There are, of course, moments where you notice that um, this bulwark of politics is 
slowly eroding, of course, through the concrete work of um, Sea Rescue, where I have, where we have positive experiences, moments of success that make you want to keep going. But what I also um, think is very important and what makes me feel very strong with our um, research flights, we document how many people are at sea when we actually manage to um, to transmit, to publicize what is happening every day there, to um, make people aware of this and attract attention to what is happening every day, what is happening at the... These are small moments where you realize that this is worth it and that you have to keep going. I would like to say something as well. I don't really feel frustration. I think the activist work sometimes reaches its limits. Sometimes we don't go further. But through this work, we are always impeding that the situation deteriorates further. So every moment for me is a success. We are preventing the situation from deteriorating further and trying to improve it. Thank you. I believe this is an excellent final and closing remark for tonight and for this discussion. Uh, I just, um, unfortunately, um, time is reduced, um, and I still would like to take the time to thank everyone for being here, and you asked me to make the following announcement and to um, name the organizations who participated in the Action Alliance for the Declaration of Cologne. Köln spricht das Netzwerk Rechtskritik Rainbow Refugee Support Group Cologne e.V., Roots and Roots Cologne e.V., Solidarity City Cologne, Solimed Köln und Tatort Ports, keine Ruhe nach dem Schuss. Auch diesen Organisationen gilt unser Thank Dank. Thank you very much to all these organizations and to all of you. And of course, I thank my guests, Doreen, Maximilian, Corinna, and Tarek. Thank you for being here and sharing your experiences, your knowledge with us. And of course, I thank the audience that uh, came to Schauspielkön today and listened to this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, for me personally, this conversation is extremely important. The question precisely is how to go on. And I thank you all, Doreen and Max as well, that you followed our invitation. And I wish you a good evening before our election. And tomorrow we continue. For those who are watching us um, on the live stream, on Instagram, and who are streaming this format in English so that it becomes accessible to a global audience, um, we are also licensing this event uh, to make it accessible for everyone. And I would also like to say goodbye to our guests who follow the live stream and announce that the live stream is ending here. I hope to see you again very soon following the School of Resistance in Kiev that we organize with the Münchner Kammerspiele. This is the end of the live stream and we go on with our live audience. 15 zeigen wir hier auf der großen Leinwand.